Is that enough blocks? Yeah, that's plenty of blocks. Okay, great. I got yeah. more if you need them. No, no, no. You got real problems. Hey, everyone. It's me, Neil Brennan. It's this, the Blocks Podcast. My guest today I've known for an easy 15. Maybe a hard... Easy 15. I was going to say hard 20, but easy 15. I heard about his pilot for Adult Swim. <laughs> called the Eric Andre show and somebody said specifically you might not like it <laughs> then I watched it and it was one of my favorite shows of all time of course that's the Eric Andre show thank you and he's uh got like spin-offs like the, you were in the jackass movie <laughs> the Eric Andre movie he's got a Netflix special he opened for Chris Rock for a while had a bad set in New Orleans I remember he <laughs> called me about and he's did here I call now. you about yeah, it? Yeah, you did. <laughs> it was. It still haunts me. I still talk about it. <laughs> Eric Andre, ladies thank and you. Gentlemen. I'm fixing Eric. the tongue of my shoe. Eric Andre, and he he went to Eric Andre wardrobe before he got here. If you're <laughs> if you're not if you're listening to this, he's wearing a tie dye shirt with New York robbery yep. written on it in the style of New York lottery. May have gotten it on Broadway between Ninth and Tenth in New York store. <laughs> Uh, so he handed this to me as I was walking perfect. the streets. Um, and These he's are all wearing free shorts <laughs> with serial clothes. killers, uh, police sketches on it. <laughs> and if I saw it in the store, I would go, those are Eric Andre shorts. <laughs> and somebody gave it to him. And he's he made a decision to wear Reeboks 15 years ago. And you've never not. <laughs> <laughs> He'll wear a Reebok pump. Right now he's wearing like memory. the guy who works at the gym. There's the Reebok Velcros, like that 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 bodybuilders wear, yep. and with puffy socks. Yeah, and you go the other way. You're these are great. You're wearing the nurse. You're wearing like Reebok. I don't know, nurse. I don't know the the trainer at the gym with the puffy socks. No, 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 it's not the trainer. It's the bodybuilders. You know those dudes like to, they dress like yeah. Tony Little. Still remember yeah. Tony Little? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They um, got Velcro Reeboks. Yeah, they still. It's an incredibly specific detail to I, to to know and take in. That's why you're a comedian. That's why. That's why I moved out of here. Eric Andre. Hey. Now I know you're not known for having neuroses necessarily oh, well, personally you Don't are I. but your brand is more chaos <laughs> and sort of recklessness right whenever i see someone doing that i just think what's the what are they escaping <laughs> <laughs> hey, what is their problem <laughs> i don't like pathologizing everything yeah I wish I felt the same way. I yeah, I don't think that every comedian or artist or musician, every single creative choice comes from pain or some mental health I agree. issue. I'm not saying that it doesn't come from that sometimes with me, but I think like there's too much of like, oh, you're avoiding, you're yeah, escaping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. it's not nothing's a hundred percent. There's yes. no absolutes in nature. Yes. Not everything is like that black or white. Yep. You know, I think the that sad some clown of it is, and the yeah, the dark that? poet and the sad clown and all that. It's yeah, like, yeah or you're just like I know people that are just funny. Yeah. Like and they I mean, Mulaney was always the example, turns out he had some stuff going on. But he had a great joke where he's like, So many people are depressed and not funny at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> so why are we making it like oh oh it's the depression yeah, that makes it's, it's them like, funny we're, no we're just it's we're all everything right right um, so yes i think that i am anxious i have add and i have obsessive compulsive thoughts to he's this both, guy but. this guy's open and strong we're gonna take him one at a time okay here we go sure anxiety sure um, do you blame your Jewish side for the anxiety? Of course. Got to. Got you hate to. The I mean, the black stuff. side ain't not anxious. <laughs> My dad escaped Haiti with 20 bucks in his pocket. He like left the uh, dictatorship. So he had a, Was a that bit of anxiety. Baby Doc? Or uh yeah, he, he lived through doc. Papa, doc, Papa and, doc and he escaped during Baby Duck. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so he was he didn't have a for, perfect. For as health. awful as they were, pretty adorable nicknames. Very adorable nicknames. You got to say cute. what you want about the docs. Yeah. Say what um, <laughs> um, okay. So you probably parsed as an adult. You said when, before we started rolling, um, that you've tried every possible treatment and you told me, can we talk about where you're going on Monday? Yeah, I'm going to 
for the first time to do ayahuasca in Peru. Peru. What made you start doing like where you, so you'd be anxious and you'd be like, I don't like this. And I, I, when did you start realizing like, oh, I don't think I'm like other people? Probably forever, but I, I, I think I started therapy around when I was 25, I think. Yeah. And I started meditating. I started meditation when I was 25, 26. And did you stick with it? Yeah, I do it twice a day every day for the past. TM? Yeah. Great. What's your mantra? I'm kidding. <laughs> what made you start? You just didn't like your in your body experience? Uh, I was getting anxiety attacks and panic attacks. I, I would have panic attacks about nothing. I would have anxiety attacks like in meetings and auditions and stuff like that. And there is some stuff that's like natural performance anxiety. Sure. You know, you know stage fright, which is like normal. But um, it it doesn't it just didn't feel normal i just wanted like more agency over my mind did it like start helping immediately immediately meditation started helping immediately um immediately and, and i and i'm not perfect i don't claim to be but it definitely it, it definitely like it's it's just part of my body what, now and it's, it's part of my routine I yeah it's like a it's like a hunger it's like a, oh it's lunchtime you know it's like time for the second meditation the great day. do you feel your thoughts changing before you're like all right i gotta sit Meaning, does it like, does the morning sit start to wear off and then? Yeah, usually in that like post lunch lull, I'll do my second meditation where a European person would take a three hour siesta. I do my second 20 minute. Meditation. I don't know why you have to bring the Europeans into it in a negative way. And I don't think you mean <laughs> that European. wasn't in a negative way. I'm like, they got it oh, made. Yeah, they, yeah, I wish right. I had a three hour. I wish we could do. You're right. You know, you're not French wrong. French hours on set. and something um, like. Okay. So that slowly got better the the anxiety and you did you stop having like attacks in high pressure situations i stopped having like full white out disassoci disassociative like full-blown panic attacks. what would you do when you had them when before you started meditating? i would be completely out of body and i would flop sweat and could you see it? were you looking at yourself or you were just like it wasn't you couldn't operate I would sometimes operate. Sometimes I would. The very first stand-up set I did on television was live at Gotham, and I was like completely out of body for the first joke. I made the mistake of like inviting a bunch of high school friends to the taping, and they yep. sat them all front row, which yep. is like total amateur hour. I remember looking at the tape and being like, "Well, oh, it was totally fine. I couldn't. I couldn't tell at all. Really? I couldn't tell at all. Yeah, but that is funny. Where you went? Because I had some panic attacks on stage, and and then I would listen back, and it wasn't that bad yeah. but it's so it would ruin even if you get through the first joke you're upset the whole time yeah because you're like why did that happen yeah because you don't know you yeah. have no idea yeah i started taking beta blockers on stage yeah i the beta blockers i tried a little bit and they made me feel a little bit strange but uh uh it's better than having a panic attack yeah it's better than having a yeah and i don't, they don't make me feel strange yeah um they just make me crush. <laughs> have you seen my comedy? Um, I haven't. You're very, very good at it. Uh, okay, so you you had anxiety on stage, and you would have them in life. Like, do you? Yeah, I would have them in life. <clears throat> I've been having pretty bad anxiety lately. I think just from I was doing pretty good, like everybody. This sounds hack. I was doing pretty damn good until I want to say pretty damn good, but I was doing pretty good until quarantine. Quarantine, mm -hmm. I don't know. A lot of drinking in quarantine, and my dad got cancer in quarantine. And then he died in December, but uh, so that was that's been tough. And um, you just from like an idle mind, you were sitting there and you were like, I yeah, it was just the end of the world. I mean, like it was during the George Floyd stuff, and Trump was turning the country into a military state. I was stuck in my house for two years and just like couldn't do stand up and couldn't shoot, and uh, you know, yeah, I, you know, I loved it. <laughs> Did you really? Uh, part, there were parts of it I absolutely. <clears throat> there was loved. parts of it that I that were kind of like an amazing reset on society. Yeah, and you got to like read the book you've been meaning to read, and like whatever, take the cook more, and there there were there were the art of the deal. There that was the good. that was the book I was trying to read. <laughs> art of the deal, mind calm, and then I would cook my and I would cook my Trump steaks. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm with you, but you 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 quickly realized that like ah this is not working for me i mean i'm still realizing it i don't know it was uh i wasn't making the healthiest choices i probably wasn't exercising as much but like uh life is in chapters and waves and cycles and stuff like that so 
have you figured yours out or you only see them in retrospect i think you're constantly figuring them out maybe i think you're constantly figuring them out it is like yeah. i told taylor Townsend. it's like you just go like all right here's my new idea for how to do it yeah and you just go it's like a it's like we all have these like fucking hoopty cars and we're like i put tape under the chassis uh, and i'm wrapping it around uh, and then i'm gonna run it off uh peanut oil uh, <laughs> and and you just go like i'm gonna meditate and then i'm gonna exercise more uh, and then i'm but i'm not gonna shoot and i'm gonna live here yeah and you just go like i don't maybe and if it works for a year fucking great yeah great yeah and i also have to when you when you're going through anxiety or, or depression you feel like you're all alone and you're the only one on earth experiencing it yeah. but my therapist says, like, amoebas have anxiety. Every living creature experiences anxiety in some shape or form. It's the amount and how often you're uh, um, facing it that makes it, you know, potentially crossing over into Small anxiety world. disorder. But, like, it, every, like, I used to feel all alone. For many years, I, you f I felt all alone in my anxiety, but uh, the, the world shares my pain not more everybody than not yeah more than not. they say 10 percent, but it's like it's more than 10 percent <laughs> what it's gonna be 90 percent. well when it, you start talking about to, to yes. other people like have you ever had a panic attack They're like fuck yeah have you yeah, had anxiety attack right yeah my anxiety's through the roof have you had depressive spells yeah like when you yeah. start talking to people about it you're like oh i'm not i'm not uh, alone and also my therapist will be like you do pranks where people are pulling knives out on you and chasing you with your dick and balls out in the <laughs> middle of the street like yeah. that's anxiety provoking you, it's okay to feel you're a bitch if you feel anxiety <laughs> <laughs> you, I brought that's you my therapist you. said you're a fucking bitch you're if you bitch. feel <laughs> and do you want this or not do you want to have do you want to get picked up for a fifth season can or you not? imagine the worst therapist <laughs> um no he's well they they're right Ooh, yeah. they, that's like you're you are set i mean that might be a thing not to pathologize it, pathologize it but like you are controlling it, so to speak. You know when it's going to come. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. When you're doing, when you're like writing a stunt, do you expect, is there like a psycho plan? Like, all right, if the psycho comes, then I have to. All the time. Like Wait. that's probably step one or near step one. No, it's always creative first. It's always like, what's cracking us up in the writer's room the yeah. most? And I'm not thinking about the danger the most because it, it, it's not oh it's dangerous so therefore it's funny it's like sometimes the most simple g-rated stuff is the funniest yeah. stuff so so it's not about the danger of it but some pranks have a certain level of danger um and uh yeah i mean back in the day we didn't have security we didn't like we did everything real gorilla so like we had like different code words it would be like all right, if I say red banana, that means the cops are coming. If I say oh, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, that means I'm like about to get beat up. We yeah. had all these different co and we never used any of them. My anxiety would like surge because somebody had me by like And you take the hours collar. to memorize them? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I have flashcards. <laughs> so you would build in anxiety and I mean, I, do you, I weirdly feel like oddly comfortable with them, but it took me a decade. It's a very like Malcolm Gladwell thing. Well, it is immersion therapy. You're like yeah. putting yourself in incredibly stressful situations. Yeah. Has it gotten you less generally stressed off camera? No, I have weird anxiety is a fiction and it doesn't, it's a distraction and it doesn't, it's not logic. It's illogical. So I'll have, I'll be doing pranks where a guy's about to like take out a, you know bash a bottle over my head in an open carry state in rural georgia and i'm just like thinking about like am i blocking a camera right now the guy's about, yeah. about to murder me and i'm like i'm like i'm like all right the gopros are there mm -hmm. the, yeah, the hides are mm -hmm. there no no I'm oh uh, uh, yeah yeah what's that no. oh i was just joking you know and i'll be totally comfortable in that situation but then i'll go home at night and i'll hear a little creak when I'm like half asleep in bed, I'll be like, a burglar's coming into my house. There's monsters under my bed. <laughs> oh, geez. And then I'll be up for like three hours. Have you considered putting GoPros everywhere in your, <laughs> in everywhere violent, in your house? In a violent, murderous Georgian. Yeah, <laughs> like, and just like to get a good night's sleep. Like you, that way you can focus. Wear the Maybe. Bur wear the bird up costume. <laughs> oh, bird up.
That guy wore rollerblades, right? I never wore rollerblades while I was in that costume, but I, I, I have worn rollerblades yeah. when I have uh, the Sprite dad. It's like a sad sack single dad trying to get a Sprite sponsorship. I'm Sprite tough. And he has like rollerblades and he's trying to do extreme sports, but he has like compound fractures yes. sticking and out of his And they leg. would be part, it would kind of be part of Bird Up or ed next to it? No, it would be separate for Bird Up, but like it's just like hyperactive editing and segments. So yeah. It, it, it feels uh, that's why people thought I wouldn't like it. Um, but I have a green outfit in both. There you go. I have a green outfit See? in both. See, told you. Yes. Yeah. Um, you don't understand your show. <laughs> um, okay. So and you're here to confront me. Yeah. And it, I've I've had it up to you. And you're a pussy. Uh, and you don't sound get, just like my therapist. You don't get what you're doing. Um, okay. So you talked about drinking, and I always. Whenever people have like what they think they might drink to excess, it's almost always anxiety because I have no desire to Wait, drink. What do you mean? Meaning anyone who's like, hey, you drink or like is like drink. You talk about drinking too much during COVID or in general, every person I know who who has alcohol issues or they think they do, they all have anxiety. Uh huh generalized uh -huh. so it is a bit of like self-medicating yeah even though like i think self-medicating is like overused but but i think in that case it is just like a sedative well a therapist told me there's little difference between alcohol and xanax and benzodiazepines mm -hmm. the way they work they they pummel your gaba receptor so that you experience less anxiety in the moment but there's a boomerang effect and your anxiety shoots back like a geyser tenfold do they know when it's just like it will yeah, they know when because there's different, I think, the half-lifes yeah. for each benzo and alcohol. So Xanax has a half-life and, and Ativan and, and, and Clonopin. But alcohol is basically a primitive Xanax. It's a primitive liquid Xanax, but it's very caustic because it's ethanol. So ethanol, your liver converts ethanol into this toxin called acetaldehyde, which is a carcinogenic toxin. So... Um, I never really drank that much until quarantine and my quarantine hobby was making cocktails. And it's like, I'm not drinking right now because I'm prepping for ayahuasca, but um, I never drank, I've never drank it every day in my life. I've never like drinking in the morning or anything like that. But there was times in quarantine when it was like that. I was like, oh shit. And it was fun, but <laughs> it's not sustainable. And yeah. I just wish there was a drug that reduced your anxiety in a social setting that wasn't as bad for you as benzodiazepines and alcohol. But there really isn't, except for nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is okay. Right, but that doesn't really reduce your anxiety. For me, it does a little but bit. But what do you just have a balloon? Everybody else has a, has a glass and you just have a giant fucking... Yeah. You like hookah? Yeah, yeah kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of, yeah. <laughs> Great. I didn't even know you could do that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know what? I did laugh. I have a dentist that gives me laughing gas. It's fucking great. And it is pretty great. I don't I don't feel much need to talk when I'm on it, but I could. Yeah. I start to feel like a little disconnected from my my uh, experience when I'm on wh Whippets, so to speak. Yeah. I think whippets and mushrooms are probably the only two things that reduce my anxiety that I don't feel are totally bad for me. Well, have you microdosed? Mushrooms, yeah. Yeah. And macrodosed. Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, do you, and how? what happened with microdosing? It's great. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, feel, so, I feel great. <laughs> have you just, you've done it consistently? No. Why not? I don't know. You, you it's should hard try to do it. Well, I've done it. The thing about I've done it before work. And I felt a little like groggy on the back half of the day. That's what happens to me. I felt like a little bit like, uh, it was great in the morning, but yep. in the back half of the day, it was a little bit, I was a little like, like I have not exact, feeling like going back to work. I have the that. exact same experience yeah. where I'm like, when I, when I have to do spots, I'm like, I'm like, I can't really remember my act. Yeah. And it's just like, so there's microdose acid. But the last time I did acid, it was, it kicked my fucking ass. It wasn't a microdose. Last time I did acid, I was like, I think I'm done with acid. Like, it's, I don't need to do this anymore? Yeah, I think I've aged out of acid. It's fucking strong. It takes so long to finish. This isn't microdosing, though. I have really tried microdosing acid, but it just felt gross in my body in a way that mushrooms don't. Mushrooms, my stomach goes like, Meh, like right when they're kicking in, and I'm like, ah, shit, and then and then I'm totally fine. There's just yeah. like a little, like, a little stomach shimmy, and, and then and then I'm and then I'm fine. LSD is is too 
it feels too acidic to me. <laughs> like the experience is, I said, LSD is like mushrooms on acid. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, but it's got like a techno spirit. Yeah, yeah. It feels that chemical I, in a way that yeah, mushrooms doesn't. Like I don't know what it was like in the 50s before yeah, techno. Yeah. Like, but it's fucking, it's too intense. It's, it's intense. It seems kind of useless to me. Like yeah. I can't take anything from it. Other yeah. than just like, Argh. yeah, it's a, it's a, it's the teeth grinder. Yeah, and it just doesn't end. You're like, all right, I'm. It's time to go to. It's seven a.m. Yeah, it's time to go to bed. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <Argh. laughs> um. Okay. And do you feel like you are? Are you trending in the right direction? Because you said when we started, you were, you were like, you've done everything. Oh, I, I think I've never really tried SSRIs. I tried Lexapro for like five seconds, and when it kicked in, it felt like bad acid or like like weird like ketamine. But my friend was like, "SSRIs take a second. You gotta like sit through those weird side effects. There's as a kind of like threshold period if you're really gonna try them." And I have people that swear by them. They saved my life. I love them. I have people that was like took me a while to find the right one. I have people that are like, "I hate them." I I, I felt more depressed. So to each their own, like I've never really experimented with any of them. I don't know why. I don't know why I would have an ego about it, but I guess I do because I, I, I can't figure out any other reason why I've been. Like, Not after ayahuasca. you okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I got my ayahuasca trip coming up. I'm going to yep. try that and then see if uh, on the backside of that I even need to. I will say just basic stuff that you always forget and and men are kind of dumb and i'm single i really need a girlfriend a, a single man is a dumb fucking caveman you really need somebody you need a partner in life to go you're doing the thing again you're being dumb and then you go oh yeah i'm doing the fucking thing again really like and this is all to say that when i drink too much and I exercise too little i feel anxious and depressed when i drink less and exercise more i feel less anxious will you depressed. exercise today I exercised today. Outside, apparently, came in with bark in his hair. Yeah. And uh, he said- I would say bark. I would say flower. Okay. Flower. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Let's but, not look. get it twisted. I'm not, I'm not that poor. <laughs> um, and you- Bark is the poor man's flower. <laughs> yeah, it's a poor man's flower. Um, There's a class issue. That you can't <laughs> get near a garden. Uh with, not in that outfit. Yeah. Um, okay, so you are. It you just go up and down. It's like you were saying chapters where you're on top of it. You're doing your shit, being healthy, and then and then you're just like you just kind of get slack. Yeah. Well, I think moving. I moved to New York two days after my dad died, and it was cold and dark. And my community that was his last wish for you. <laughs> Please <laughs> move to New York by the power of baby duck. Um, you know, it always say that by the power of baby <laughs> So I mean, like, that's why I don't like pathologists and everything. Like, that's a reason to be depressed. Were you planning on moving? I was trying to move back to New York forever. Yeah. Forever. And I was like, if I don't fucking do it now, I'll never do it. And I wanted to do Eric Andre's show in New York. We do the street pranks in New York, but I wanted the whole show to be based in New York. And my original showrunner talked me out of it. And I always resented that I got talked out of it. And we always shot it in LA. And probably it was for the best, whatever. No sour grapes. But I kept wanting to move back to New York, wanting to move back to New York. I just felt more creatively fulfilled in New York, closer to my family, you know. And, uh, I just liked that it wasn't a one industry town and it had just all walks of life. I just love New York. I like LA, but I love New York. And you grew and up I, there? No, I grew up in Florida. In right. Boca Raton, Florida. Florida. Yeah. Boca Raton. So, uh, it's, well, it's in, it's in, uh, it's near Yonkers. <laughs> it's the Yonkers of Miami. Um, there were circumstances that caused me to but was it have, a, like... have a bit of a crazy winter you know right, I, i'm saying you, like not you, everything is just neurochemical makeup no i get some, it so you always wanted to just... then your father dies and do you go i'm that's it or is it like a month before you get you find a place and you you're like slowly planning or was it like a spur of the moment no well it was not spur. it was like i was trying to do it for like a decade yeah and then i was kept looking at apartments online and getting sucked back in to getting jobs out here and getting sucked back into la it was like la was like the bermuda triangle like i couldn't escape and i still have my house here I'm, yeah i'm trying to be bi-coastal bi-coastal bipolar biracial bisexual it's all i want to be um but uh 
Yeah, I'm figuring it out. New York's very expensive. Yeah. (laughs) It's incredibly expensive. Yeah. There's like like an Uber up the street is 40 bucks. Yeah. Just Uh, down the street, a half a mile. Yeah, I was going to say $32. Like, what? Half a mile. I love flying. You can fly to New York. That'll cost you $80. And then Uber from the airport to your place, that's 110 Yeah, it's insane. So I'm struggling with that. But it, it is the funnest city in the world polluted it's polluted and the quality of the food isn't as robust as the quality of the food here because a lot of restaurants can afford the farmer's market here so those are my three strikes controversial controversial opinion about the food quality the produce but and i'm I'm probably losing the fucking audience with this oh i'm just gonna 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 cut it (laughs) You ain't losing shit. You can, it you ain't can. in the podcast, my friend. Food sourcing. <laughs> fucking you kill me. You can live this fucking out. Kill me. I apologize fucking to your editor. Kill. Apology accepted. I am sorry that you Fuck. had to drain your energy watching Fuck. this footage. You owe footage. me for the hard drive space for that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I really got on a tangent. Well, guy's when I talk here. to you, I feel uh, very comfortable. Great. And I feel like I can um, use parts of your brain that you don't normally, and you're more area. Yeah, right? you you've been you're very therapized. Thank you. So because you're so therapized, I love talking therapy with sure. you. Sure, and you no, always, I you always you always give great advice. Would you're have sage. Loved- you're a sage. Thank you. Would have loved therapy talk. We went into food prep, and it was a nightmare. I. <laughs> <laughs> um all right so what i want to you brought up you brought you mentioned doing the tv show i meant how did you like having a tv show i found it incredibly stressful yeah in a way that it didn't bring out the best in me and i wonder how you approached it and if you liked it or are happy with your your behavior i think every single project is stressful yes. i don't there's no project i've ever done that's like this is no, stress free. Yeah, exactly. Some more stressful than others. Unless you're totally checked out, it's stressful. Yeah. Yeah. But even being checked out, then you're like, why am I doing why this? Why am I why am I doing this? Why and is it gonna some... suck because I'm checked out? Yeah. It and, and if I feel and like it the is. The fact is it's gonna. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna. If you don't care about it, if you're not stressed and anxious about it, I think like I always say, pain in writing is pleasure in pre-production. Pain in pre-production is pleasure in production pain in production is pleasure in the editing bay the more stressed you're in and you're getting those fights in prep and and shooting the more you're like i'm so glad i fought for that fucking scene for that little dumb hand prop yeah for that fucking one piece of wardrobe for that earring dangling off that one actor's ear i'm so glad i fought for every fucking square inch of that shit yeah because now i'm in the editing bay and i'm happy i hate the feeling of being in the editing bay and being like fuck i compromised i bit my tongue I was just fucking exhausted and I didn't have the energy to fight back and push back against and that. All now, the and now I'm watching that, and permanently forever, it's going to be this shitty scene that I fucking hate. Yep. And all the people that talked you out of it, gone. Gone. Or they don't even remember Can't the fight. Them. Yep. That's what my producer always says. He goes, yeah, we're in OT. We're in overtime and everybody's stressed. We got a wrap. We're in overtime. And it goes, two months from now, no one is going to remember day seven of production when yeah. you went into OT. No one's even going to give a fuck. Everybody's stressing out. But no one, to, to, not even two months, four weeks from now, no one's going to remember that we were stressed this day about this thing. And if they do remember, they're going to laugh about it. So, And also you make everybody sign an NDA so no one can say shit. <laughs> yeah, you hear that? <laughs> These people have no rights. <laughs> Best of luck getting the word out. You're, I'll see you in court. <laughs> Tell it to the judge, your, your, your grievances with... But people get very stressed on set because it's like they're sleep deprived. So and it's stressful. But there's the stress leads to and you, euphoria you, if you, you create yeah, a good how project. How did you, uh, the TV show, euphoria? How did you. The TV show, the television show. Not, yeah, that's not how you, it's all stressed. The television show. Um, <laughs> if, you, if your prep on Eric Andre is good enough, it becomes the TV show <laughs> Euphoria. Um, he fought for Eric Andre to be played by Zendaya. I could go on with this metaphor probably yes. too long. Yes, not did long you, enough. Did you, how did you, um, how did you, did it just take you a while to be able to hold your ground? Stand your ground, if you will? Stand, well, I am from Florida, the stand your ground <laughs> state. And my producing partner is George Zimmerman. So, so pretty great. You're lucky <laughs> oh, to get yeah, him. I, absolutely. Like it takes, it's, it's like, um, 
you you build your confidence slowly over time with this career but you you really you get to a point where your back is against the wall in some meetings and you're like i have to like scream and fucking be like we are doing this yes uh or i'm just gonna be miserable i rather have like the pain and stress of yeah. this one afternoon meeting than the pain and stress of watching it in the movie theaters or whatever forever and just being like i sh i why did i there's yeah. a very specific scene in bad trip that no one wanted to do and it's one of the best scenes in the movie it's where tiffany haddish is <clears throat> she's hiding on a prison bus in the undercarriage of the bus excuse me this guy that we're pranking, real guy, real pedestrian, is like cleaning graffiti on the side of the road. Can you help me get out? And she pops out from under the prison bus. Oh, man. In a prison jumpsuit, and she's like, dude, can you hide me? Can you hide me? And the guy's like, oh, fuck. Oh, shit. Uh, go that way. Go that way. And then the 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 the, the prison bus driver comes off, and she, he's like, did you see anybody? No. Like, won't snitch for her at first, and then he's just like, go that way. Go that way. And that scene was one of the biggest laughs in the movie and I had to fight tooth and nail. We tried it a different way where we found this old prison and we hid Tiffany in the ground, poor Tiffany. We had to hide her in the ground and she like popped up in front of a bunch of people touring a prison. It was like real hinky and then she came up and people just thought, knew it was a bit and they all started yeah. laughing. We had like a little piece of people sho initially shocked but the reaction was not good. The, yeah. people, the marks weren't on the hook. And people were, everyone at the studio, every my producing partner was like, that scene's good enough, that scene's good enough. And I was like, that scene isn't good enough. Yeah. We've screened it a bunch of times. It never gets a fucking laugh. It's a huge lull, it's a dud. And John Favreau gave me the best piece of advice. He said, being a filmmaking is like DJing. He goes, every scene, you gotta keep the fucking party jumping. Even if you have three, four great scenes in a row, if you have one lull, if you have one dud song you're DJing, the crowd fucking checks out and it's so much energy to get them back on track. Yeah. And I was just like, I fought tooth and nail for that fucking scene to happen. I, I remember having like a freak out at a meeting and I don't like, I'm non-confrontational. I don't like, like behaving that way at work. And thank God it began, it was like the one of the big, and then when we tested the the screening of the, after the reshoots, that was part of the reshoots that got one of the biggest laughs of the fucking movie. Did anyone like, acknowledge you? Oh, I pat myself on the back. I went got back to the you. office and I yep. patted myself on the back louder than anyone. Absolutely. I was like, you guys see all this bat back <laughs> patting that I'm fucking doing right now? They're like, all right, all right. And we all had like wins and losses like that. I had scenes where I was like, I don't know if we need to shoot that. And my producing partners were like, no, we're fucking doing that. So we all had wins and losses. And 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 it it, it was like the pressure of that collaboration that, that made that movie a success. So it, I don't look back on that stress like it was bad it's hell when you're going Do through you it's like ayahuasca you know you were going yes. through bad fucking gnarly parts of the trip but you come out you rise up out of the ashes well, like a phoenix the thing for next week just remember you will be better off yeah whatever you're experiencing in that moment you're just like no i this is how it works it's just yeah. it's difficult and then but i'll be better for it yeah it's very hard it's very hard it's kind of weirdly harder than hard than you than your understanding of hard mm -hmm. prior but mm -hmm. you're better off because of it. yeah um, there was times in the bufo that were like torturous but it was, it was short it was fleeting but like it was bufo it was almost every emotion i'd f it would feel like i was in the center of the universe having ten thousand orgasms but also having like extreme pain but that pain turned into catharsis and i came out of it bawling crying that's bufo alvarius dmt um toad venom it toad the toad as mike tyson called it do you understand the toad done it a hundred times that's, mike tyson. that's wild i did it once and it lasted a year and a half <laughs> and when you said amoebas have anxiety yeah the worst anxiety i've ever had in my life was as an amoeba yeah on dmt really where i was i was an amoeba and i didn't know anything wow i didn't know direction blinking god I didn't know any, I didn't know. I formed the first synapse. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. DMT. You know how I feel about tickets and where to get them. You know what 
You could probably read this along with me. You know how you worry about stuff? I worry about stuff. This whole podcast is about worrying about stuff. With Game Time, you can stop worrying about stuff. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you with killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from receipt, and their best price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Let's make fun of some stuff. Football, the Chargers, and the Rams, they're playing. I recently did a commercial with a bunch of NFL players, and I asked them what the most messed up thing they ever heard on the field was. And if you meet me in person, I'll tell you what they were. They were pretty goddamn funny. Pink, ladies and gentlemen, pink does stadiums. I repeat, pink does stadiums. It's a big show. I think there's a trapeze. I feel like there's motorcycles probably. She seems like she's into motor. I know she dated a, or married a motorcycle gentlemen so good for you pink trippy red does arenas he's at the forum tonight trippy red could not tell you a trippy red song uh SZA does arenas SZA charging a hefty fee for her arenas good for you SZA we're all rooting for you SZA and thank you for making your name SZA it's like when people say season but it's SZN pretty cool SZA Pretty cool stuff from SZA. It, this is all Travis Scott back in stadiums. No comment. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view from your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All in prices show your total upfront so you know you're getting a great deal without hidden fees. Buy tickets in seconds with two taps. Just two taps. Tap, tap. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code BLOCKS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code BLOCKS for $20 off your first purchase. Game Time. Last minute tickets. Lowest prices. Guaranteed. Have you gotten better at like remaining calm when the stakes, when the when you're up against the wall? Because I I'm not good at remaining calm. I'm never I'm, good I'm, at I'm, it. I'm never good at it. Uh, you know the the mantra in those moments is this too shall pass. You know what I'm going over with my um, MDMA therapist is is um, you can't think your way out of it. You got to feel your way out of it. You just said something. It's a it's wild. Which is your MDMA therapist? Yeah. Tell me about what is that? It's therapy where you do some sessions where you do MDMA. How often? I've talked to him a million times and I've only done the. Uh, I did just MDMA once, and I did MDMA with psilocybin uh, the second time. Um, and it's incredible. Do you sit? And he's do you speak to him the whole master. time? Um, no. So I, I do talk sessions with him all the time. But my uh, MDMA sessions, he comes over to your house. You lie on your couch with a blanket, put on a sleep mask. He puts on headphones. He plays music. You take it. He, he talks to you beforehand. He's like, you want to set any yeah. intentions or whatever. And then, and then you take it and you, um, he just kind of babysits you and you, you can check in with him if you want to, but you kind of just sit there with your thoughts and you cry if you want to cry mm -hmm. and you, you go through, I mean, the last one I was bawling, crying, scream. I was like, so there's times where I was like screaming, like, ah, like just letting it all. It was incredibly cathartic, incredible catharsis that and the, the, the toad venom were like the two most cathartic. The Toad Venom, I like talked to my dad after he died. Like I told him it was okay to pass and and I'll see you, I'll, I'll see you again. again Did he respond? Him. It was like all feeling. It wasn't, I, I wasn't on earth. Yeah. I wasn't on no, earth using er earthly things. I was speaking thoughts, but it was I wasn't speaking English. So I just knew he was there and I was like, I, it's okay to, to continue on to the next to the next existence and I'll, I'll I'll join you again one day and I love you and I miss you and I came out of that. That was those are the first like thoughts that were kind of in English. After I hit it it was like fucking to, total like center of the universe shit and uh I came out of it bawling crying and it was like incredibly cathartic and then the MDMA psilocybin therapy is incredibly it's catharsis that you can't get without that stuff it, it, i used to yell at my therapist it's in my body i can't keep talking about this yeah i know the problems i like, got my dad and my mom yeah yeah this yeah. this shit's just in me yeah and ayahuasca dmt and thanks to ayahuasca and dmt mdma now 
is also ayahuasca and DMT for me. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's the same. It's an. In, I was an atheist. It's an instant God connection. Mm -hmm. And and I say that with zero embarrassment because we're in LA and you believe in God. Fuck yeah. <laughs> um, like and they'll throw eggs at you and stuff. It's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like rude and people don't talk about it. Um, but I've gotten so much f beautiful shit from MDMA. It's breathtaking. I, yeah. I know I know cause it used to not work for me. Mm. I took it and it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. Now, not only does it work, I, it's changing me mm -hmm. for the better. Yeah. It's an incredible, it's an incredible. And I'm not doing it with a therapist either. Like I'm yeah. just doing it. I doing it at the club. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah. I'm doing it at home by myself. That's a strip club. At a strip club. At friends. Yeah, exactly. Strip clubs, uh, Home Depot. Yeah, at the Players Club. Um, <laughs> uh, but the that I've never really heard anybody else talk about MDMA helping them in that way. I mean, I've heard about it on. Uh, but it's no un, one I know. Un, it's uh, uh, unbelievable. And there, you can look up why, like you know, you, you, trauma stored in the amygdala, yep, yep, and it allows yep. access to the amygdala. But like. Even when I said that to my, the MDMA therapist, and he goes, have you ever seen an amygdala? And I go, no. And he goes, do you know what it looks like? I go, it's almond-shaped gland. And he goes, you got, you're got you always thinking from here up. He goes, I need you in your body. You can't think your way out. You got to feel your way out. And so, you know, this is piggybacking off what you said about, you know, your therapist keeping you kind of like from the, the neck up yeah. thinking the whole time. It's like, it, it is all in your organs, all, all that pain and trauma. It's all, and I don't even say, I, organs. I feel like all like epigenetics and tr stored trauma and all that stuff. I, it is true when it, when it's left, when it's left epigenetics, me, I don't know what that is. Epigenetics is you, like, you flew your parents, over my head with that. Fucking... Your parent, it's your dad's stress from Haiti, your mom, oh, transgenerational trauma, yeah. that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. My experience is like going through IA, DMT, and MDMA. I'm better off afterward, but I didn't feel it. Although I do shake, so maybe that's part of it. I'm like, I do pretty significant shaking. That's pretty wild, but it's not like there it goes. Yeah, <laughs> there's no. Although the other day on MDMA, I was I was like doing this, and I was forgiving people. Yeah, and it was like it was outstanding yeah like outstanding like why are you doing this at a club yeah don't d you're throwing it away yeah like do it or, or some just do something else at a club like yeah. this shit can really help you yeah what were you screaming about on it nothing specific i wasn't like it, it wasn't it was it was beyond words you know i wasn't mm -hmm. like and this is stress about the bully from sixth grade yeah. it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't like that yeah it was it was ineffable you know it was uh i think just the stress of the past few years all yeah culminating it was it was like purging but yeah. without the vomit yeah but it felt the same like ah, like like this like yeah uh, like going into labor. I, yeah. I guess I can't say what that is. It feels like, but it was like this, like, like from my perineum upwards, this, it was purging without vomiting. <laughs> it, that's what it felt like. It was almost like, it was like shitting and coming and vomiting. It was like, yeah. Ah, and, and like yawning, every yawning, yawning and crying yeah, and, yawning, and yeah. burping. Yeah. And, yeah, 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 and your ears popping. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> no, dude, I'm, I'm with like MDMA is like, damn, yeah, like fucking damn, yeah, that's great. Um, and okay, so you, you're, you fought the, uh, the, the, the big fights at work. You've, do you, how much better do you think you are than you were ten years ago I, overall? And I don't Before mean like. Before I started going to therapy, I was a mess. Early twenties, my anxiety, but I didn't even know how tangled it was, and like what mental health and physical health, and you know. You mentioned girlfriends before. Have wanting a girlfriend. Girlfriends, the the CW show. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of, <laughs> lot of, not as Tracy jokey. Ellis Ross. <laughs> yeah, not as jokey as you think. That show. They would have long moments of like a minute and a half without a joke i like living single you were a before. living single guy from way back mm -hmm. do you judge yourself for not being married with kids uh sometimes i'll give into that societal pressure and then sometimes i uh, both sometimes like i'm like ah fuck i wasted my 20s and 30s i should have settled down and then sometimes it's the total opposite i'm like thank god i didn't settle down in my 20s and 30s i was not ready 
I was completely not ready. I wasn't ready to receive love. And that's actually something I said at the end, la, la, end of my, I don't know if it's oversharing, but the end of my MDMA psilocybin. I, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to receive love. What does that I'm mean ready to, to you? receive love. I know, I, I know, I, I know, I know you're, you're, you had it rough with your dad. Yeah. From your stand up specials. A lot of, uh, I make a lot of that shit up. <laughs> Your dad walks in the I'll door. Honest, guys, Still dad, alive, brother, dad, and I dad, love my son. My dad lives in my guest house. We one have, of my best friends. He's one of my best friends to this day. We have a podcast. It's coming out. It's, it's dropping soon. We're with we're with Wondery. That would be so psychotic. And you I know. Although I, at this sociopath. point, I would nothing would surprise me in show business. Like, oh yeah, I made that makes sense. Um, do you? So my dad said he loved me. For the first time in his life, uh, like a millisecond before he uh, st started to completely mentally unravel, and like the next day was hospice, and he was just a zombie. It was the it was maybe one of the last sentences my dad uttered was "I love you," and he never said it. But did it mean? Did it? I don't want to say did he mean it, but did it seem? He, he went, "I love you, psych." <laughs> <laughs> Give me that oxycotton. Uh, <laughs> But but you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> what you think it was? Are you asking no, it wasn't no, performative? No, no. Meaning, you know, mm. when people go, "I love you," or like, did oh no, it no, seem well, like I'll tell you, he I'll finally tell you. understood it. No, I'll tell you how it went down. And it was a feeling. He didn't die in the hospital. We we went. He he spent the last year of his life in 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 bed in the house. He didn't want to die at the hospital. He's like, I, I don't want to fucking die at the hospital. I want to die at the house. So he was in his like hospital bed in his room and like he was just always watching the news. My dad was just always like mainline MSNBC. He was just always watching the news. Still, even now. I just, I landed and he was re, he looked like the worst I've ever seen him in his life. I was like, this is the end. Uh, he looked like skeletal, like a Beetlejuice character, like Tim Burton. It is Jim crazy. Henson, it's crazy what just illness. His, and... uh, just his bones and skin. Remember that Mr. Show sketch where the they go to the burn victim? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Get on. It's obviously incredibly funny, but like, there's something to oh, that. Oh, it was hilarious. I was like, Dad, you still got Can it, brother. Can I film this? Can I make content? <laughs> no, it was. It looked like a Jim Henson creation. Yeah. It, it was like I was like, Oh no, this is the end. This is the. End. I was like, and I was like, and I looked at a picture of him a year ago when he collapsed and went to the hospital, and he looked like a million bucks with tubes hanging out of him compared to this yeah. this was like it was just like a skeleton man it yeah. was like whenever you see like footage of like um a famine in yemen yep. or ethiopia and you're like yeah. fuck humanity yeah. is fucked it was like that so i knew it was the end so i get in i fly in and i was like working all week i would like work monday through it was miserable i'd work monday through friday then i'd get on a plane land in 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 florida and on a friday night and go right to him and like just hang out there all weekend and then like sunday night monday morning fly back to work and it was tough. So I, I'm sitting there, and uh, I just got the impetus. I'm like, I'm turning off the fucking TV. Like, we never talk. He's very, like, emotionally repressed and hard to communicate with. And I was like, I'm just turning off the TV. Like, let's talk. I don't know. It's awkward to just stare at a, my dad and talk. Yeah. And I turned off the TV, and he just, like, looked over at me, and he, and he smiled, and he went, and he had no energy. I mean, he's on death's door. He just went, I love you. And I went, what? And he goes, I love you. I never meant to upset you. I love you. And I, I burst into tears. Of course. I burst into tears. And he goes, can you call my nurse? And he was almost like childlike. You know, when people start dying, they like unwind yeah. back into babyhood. And he goes, Call my nurse over. I was like, your nurse. I go, I go to his nurse. I was like, hey, come over in the room. And he went to his nurse. He goes, and he started bawling, crying. He goes, why is my son crying? I just told him I loved him. And I was like, I'm crying because I love you too. You've never said it. And, and he was like, I love you. And I was like, I love you. We started like screaming it at each other. And it was primal. I have goosebumps talking about it. I'm like choked up talking about it. Balling, crying. We're both bawling, crying. His nurse almost starts crying. And then he went, and then like oh, it's the beats, we both calmed down and he looked over and he goes, 
oh, my two friends are here. And it was just me and him and his nurse. And I go, what? And he goes, my two friends, my two old friends from Haiti. I haven't seen them for, for, for years. They're here. And I go, dad, there's no one else in the room with us. It's just me and, and your nurse. And he goes, he was like, oh, fuck. He gave me like a, oh, fuck face. He was like, fuck. And then, uh, and then he was, and then it was just like, and then the next day hospice started. It was kind of, the, it was kind of like the last conversation I had with him. And, and then, he, cause he was so, he couldn't sleep. It got to the point where his nurse goes, he spends the entire night screaming cause he's in so much pain. He would sleep for like maybe an hour yeah, and then just wake up and be like, ah, ah, ah all through the night. Ah, your like organs a, are sounds just. Like, sounds like a monologue from the Eric Andre show. <laughs> If I'm honest, <laughs> me right. So, yeah. <laughs> so we were just like, so it's hospice started, and then like you know, we had little, there'd be little tiny, th you know, moments of lucidity, but not really. So uh, I don't know why. My I question, this up. okay, I, I think I connect it. You said you're ready to receive love. Ah, yeah. So, so my my MDMA psilocybin session was a lot about that moment, and 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 my. Therapist, not the MDMA therapist, but my therapist was like, I think that that last conversation with your father healed your heart in ways that you never expected. And would uh, you agree? A hundred and ten percent. That's funny. What's the difference? Meaning, we all assume our dad loved. Well, I didn't assume my dad loved me, but but that I think I'm rare in that regard. What I'm wondering is what it. So you did you just kind of think like ah, it's kind of not a thing that the dudes like him fuck with like love and yeah my dad like was that. very aloof and absent throughout yeah. my entire childhood you know what i mean i felt ignored by my dad for mm. for um my entire childhood so uh and my parents got divorced kind of out of nowhere when i was 12. i didn't feel like my dad you know there's no extremes in nature so i i, I knew he loved me uh, i just wish he was more present mm -hmm. and uh i wish that uh he was more present, more active. Not and it's so, hard, not so you probably, it's hard to, as much as you can intellectually go, yeah, he's aloof and whatever, whatever. I, it's hard not to take his lack of presence personally. Oh, it's 100%. And so 100%. when he finally is like, hey, it really, it, did it feel like this, that was not personal? When he said, like, I'm sorry I let you down, it wasn't, I like, I really do love you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and also what helped was my dad was so he repressed his emotions so yeah. much, but he was repressive till the fucking end. When he looked like a skeleton, I was like, "How you doing, Dad?" He's like, "I'm fine. I'm great. Everything's fine." Why do fine. you ask? Why do you? Yeah, I was like, <laughs> "Why do you ask?" I was like, "You're not fine. Yeah, you should be like, I feel like hell. Yeah, I'm incredibly sick and I'm on death's door." But it was like, "Yeah, everything's fine." That was my dad his whole life. So I was like, "Damn!" Even in this extreme state he's still that repressive yeah. and that that avoidant yeah and then you know and then you see family members showing up that you haven't seen in years so i was like i always resented my dad for not supporting me going to like into the arts because i went to music college and then i got into comedy and he was always like go to med school or law school he's a psychiatrist and uh, my uncle came in who i hadn't seen in years who's a musician been a musician his whole life he's in one of the most famous bands in haiti for like 55 years and, and my uncle turned to me and goes, oh, he would say that shit to you? He would say that shit to me all the time. Don't go into music. Don't go into music. Don't go into music. He's like, I don't know. And like, he was like, I could tell he was like, he was still like a little bit like, fuck your dad for telling me that. Because my uncle was the baby brother. He was the baby amongst yeah. uh, seven children. The baby docs. So, so, <laughs> baby docs, yes. So uh, I was like, oh, it's not personal. There's a bunch of stuff came out. My friend was like, whose dad died. He goes, the secrets are going to come out. The family secrets and it's all the same it's all the same thing it's all like the thing you didn't like him for he did it to me yeah just and then badly. you're like oh why did i take it personal my dad is a human who is flawed yeah. everybody's parents are a flawed human being yeah and you're gonna and everybody is going to be a flawed human being to their kids it's you it's i think like, we misunderstand how they're gonna be flawed because yeah. you wouldn't think you would think like uh, if telling your son like to get a good job is like fairly typical immigrant, et cetera, et cetera. But then it's like, why did you do it to your brother? 
Why did it's just it becomes about the like a, a in some ways like a poverty of spirit in that regard, yeah, and not like personal to you. It's just mm-hmm. like because he's scared all the time mm-hmm. and he's like putting it on other people, yeah. And so you felt so few catharsis in life, but that actually sounds like one. The yeah. your dad said I love you, yeah, on his deathbed, yeah, and 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 bald crying like a child about it and, and i don't i don't think i ever saw my dad cry until that moment yeah even when he got the ca- oh no i i've heard him cry over the phone when radio, he, he got the cancer it. diagnosis i, I heard thought him. he won a radio contest <laughs> <laughs> he was, it was the four, on the radio he was i the heard him on, caller. <laughs> <it's> power 96 <laughs> miami's party station <laughs> i heard him cry over the phone when he got his cancer diagnosis i heard him kind of softly weep on the phone when he was telling me like I have, the, he had no money at the end. He was really bad with money. And he was like, I got this little life insurance policy. And like, like he was prepping to die. Like I heard him like weeping. But then like, it was not only the first time I, I, I he, he told me he loved me. It was the first time I saw him cry. And it was like, he was bawling crying. It wasn't subtle. So it was a really, it was fucking intense. It was one of the most intense. It sounds like it, fucking but, wildly human. Yeah, it was wildly like, human. Like, and he's tiny. He shriveled small. Shriveled like uh, the the crypt keeper from yeah. from tales tales from the crypt. Yeah. That's what he looked like. Yep. Like and the ske- every part of his skeleton you could see yeah. in different body parts. It's it's haunting to see your your one of your family members. In but that, that one of the weirdly most important moments of your life. Ooh, one of the most important moments of my life. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm trying to figure out how you get from that to be more willing to accept love. What, what? How does that inform it? Because you know that you do. You, you feel don't think more that's a direct line? I don't know. You you brought them together. You mentioned them together as uh, you feel more willing to accept love. I, I feel more worthy. I think when your father uh, is that aloof in your life, you feel unworthy. I think you feel like um, low self esteem, low self worth. So it like gave me a sense of self-worth that i didn't realize i was lacking and maybe some of it you can't put to words some yeah. of it is ineffable and i might maybe i'm wrong yeah too. i mean well or maybe wait. i'm half right yeah maybe that's part of it maybe just part of it is just like aging and maturing and yeah. and I, I don't know i don't know i guess when i think about you in relationships i see you as like a moving target that i uh, in my relationships i'm just like i'm trying i'll fall in love or whatever we're, and then you and I are probably similar in terms of like we've both been dating and like some work, some don't, short, long, whatever. Um, and then, but maybe now that you feel like that's a space you can occupy comfortably, that it won't be elusive. You won't be elusive. You won't be, I don't think, I, I attachment style is overrated, but, but maybe you'll be more willing to take a risk because in the long run, the risk with your dad did work out Mm -hmm. like it seemed like it wasn't Mm -hmm. and then it turns out like oh you did love me and it was like a buzzer beater it was like a kobe bryant three-point shot with zero seconds on absolutely kind of buzzer emotional buzzer beater okay so we talked about the things that made you better you've done every therapy and every well not every therapy you've done every they all help yeah. and they've all helped and they've helped tremendously. It also is like a routine. You really like when I go on vacation and I drink more and I exercise less and I'm not checking in with therapy, I pay the price when I'm back in the States and I'm exercising more and I'm in therapy more often. It's like therapy and exercise have now become non-negotiable. Yeah. They're non-negotiable. Yeah, they are the priority over any meeting, over any vacation, over anything I I work on. My brother Kevin does he he runs and rides bike, and he calls it running the Brennan out of him, <laughs> which is <laughs> like you feel. have like a that's you, I feel. like just yeah, I, I I have all this shit in me. Yeah. I can I have to burn it off. Yes. There's no what I can't 100%. think my way out of it. I have to just dump it. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. And uh, you gotta get well, I'm glad that moving. you know that about yourself and then uh-huh. you notice it and like will hopefully make it as make it concerted, like baked in your day as meditation and all that stuff. Yeah, it's not negotiable. Yeah, good. It's just that's uh, what, what is it's... your dream for yourself? To bring the volume of the general anxiety from here 
to hear. I think there are healthy parts about anxiety. When I'm nervous before a stand-up gig, I, I do, love that you I say do that. great. Yep. When I'm not nervous and kind of blase, I phone it in and I, I bomb or do mediocre. It's like a C minus to an F set. When I'm like, actually, like last night I had a show and I was very nervous. I was nervous last night before I went out on stage um, like like I was 10 years ago. I was like, wow, I haven't been this nervous before a show in a while. And the show was fucking great. Did it you prep? So Did you prepare? I prepared. I prepared. Yeah. That's the, I like that you said that because there is a lot, there is, and it's another question I keep forgetting to ask, which is like, what's the upside of all these, of all this downside? Do you know what I mean? Anxiety like, is healthy and it actually, I, I think like, my creativity comes from my obsessive compulsive thought patterns and anxiety. I don't think, I, but I think turning the volume down on them doesn't mean eliminating them. Eliminating them is like a Xanax. I can't walk around yeah. on like doing Xanax every day for, for life, for living life. You have, to, you have to give a fuck. I just want to take the volume down a little bit so it's in that sweet spot where I get to keep the the productivity you get to keep the productive parts of the anxiety and eliminate the the counterproductive and destructive parts of the anxiety totally agree because because uh the destructive and counter counterproductive parts are like they're just exhausting it, yeah it, it like wears me down in a way that i don't need to be worn down so i just want to turn down the volume a little bit and it, and it will help me in all aspects of my life and that's your greatest goal for yourself Outside of like career Just goals, any I, career I, you're talking about like career goals your, stuff or what love is your life ideal what? state? Like, who do you think you can be? And I don't mean what like for shit. Sure. I mean like who do you? How do you want to feel? Uh, yeah, like I just said, just yeah. turning the volume down at ever so slightly so that like I can go to bed at night, but still high enough that you can get ideas and get driven. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, you still have to give a fuck. You can't tranquilize yourself. You still have to give a fuck, and the anxiety helps you give a fuck. And like doing a show, it's like when I'm anxious before a show, it's I give a fuck. Yep. I want the joke to work. When yep. I'm nervous about a joke, it works better. Once I go, yeah, fuck yeah, that joke's now a killer. Done. It just expires. I look at the fucking tartar sauce; it's got mold on top of it. I'm like, wait, this it was perfect. What? You what happened here? And I was like, oh, I was worried about making it work before, and that's it. the audience can feel that yep. they have a hive mind. They can yes. feel like, oh shit, he's on the tightrope. Is he gonna make it? Ah, oh, he made it. Yes. When when you're like, yeah, check this out. They're like, yeah. fuck you. Yep. So I would say somewhere between purpose and a heart attack <laughs> is where I'm trying to land. Uh -huh. Like I don't, I want, I don't want to just be like, well, whatever. Yeah. But I don't want to be full of garbage and bad chemicals. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Eric Andre. Uh, great episode. Thank you. Is and this what going to get a lot it's of a nice little bit? No, it's mumbly, uh, no, mumblecore and no, heavy. No, we'll, we'll Did, do, should I have we'll, fucking hammed it up we'll, a little bit? <laughs> throw we'll some throw, cartoon sound effects over it. We're gonna put a filter over you. <laughs> and we're gonna throw the AI machine at it. I would blur my face too. I'm not gonna sign the. Release. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, all right, buddy. Great to see you. Yes, so good to see you too. Fun. Thanks, man. My man. Yeah. <laughs>